Caldwell. And today, we're talking with Olita Crane, one of the very first women of color in the Army, and we're going to discuss this for the oral history at the WAC Museum. Olita, it's a real pleasure, and I'd like to start with one question. When you were recruited into the Army, you were recruited to be a band member. But according to your biography, you never got to play in the band. Would you tell us why? It wasn't the right color. You weren't the right color, though. But when, but you were recruited to be a band member. So what did you do when they said you couldn't play in the band? I was a little shocked and disappointed, but then I asked, what were they going to do with me? And they said, well, because you have a degree, they're going to make you a cadger belt. Well, of course, that hit me. I never heard the word cadger before. <laughs> and I did go to the dictionary and look it up. And they said, the dictionary said a cadger's something around which something is built, a nuclear, I believe they called it. That didn't tell me anything. <laughs> but I finally found out that cadre members were the sergeants and the corporals who took the raw recruits and made them soldiers. So I thought that sounds all right. So you became a cadre member at Fort Des Moines, Iowa? Yes. That, because that's where you took your initial training, isn't that's it? Good. But I was first a mail clerk. They would never give us our mail on time. Well, just you or all the women? All the women. We just couldn't get our mail. I think they were overwhelmed. They had our first sergeant, and she didn't have time to take care of all her chores to go get the mail and give it to us all the time. So I cajoled and I begged to be the, the you know, the mail clerk. Mm -hmm. I finally got that job. Very rewarding to see the people be so pleased when they got their mail. Now, when you when you when you found you weren't going to be a member of a band, you started a band. You you were you got together with some other people who were musicians. And they were all colors. Well, that was not me. They knew that. You weren't part of the charcoal burners? Well, the charcoal burners was an organization. Oh. There was a group of women, all color, mm -hmm. that we decided we didn't like what we saw. And so we would meet these challenges and come up with some kind of strategy to overturn whatever it was we didn't like and to try to get something different. Well, now and that particularly we were concerned because at that time, they told us there should be only three officers to a unit. In my unit, there were 21. Because every time a black officer would graduate, they, they wouldn't assign it to a white organization. We only had one Squadron W at Fort Des Moines. I think it was Squadron W, Squadron something. And that's where they put all the black officers. So that's why we organized this thing, as they sent the white girls to the Pentagon and other places. They would listen to see what they heard they were going to do with the black officers and they'd tell us. And so we hired a lawyer, and we would meet and plan our strategies, and we had this, this was our signal to each other, the charcoal burners. Isn't that one? Isn't that, that was the first real integration then. I guess it was, we hadn't thought about it. We just a bunch of folks that liked each other. I remember we had Albert Decker, who was the, a movie star, and his sister Kay Eckett was there. And I forgot, we had Liz Rytel, whose father taught at Columbia University. She was a cartoonist who made fun of all the stupidness that went on. <laughs> but that didn't last too long because I woke up one morning and they had shipped them all out to the Mojave Desert. I've never heard from one, never found one since. Isn't that a shame? And the, some of the black officers they shipped out in the field, cell bombs. I'm amazed that I survived. <laughs> but well, I did. You, you did survive. And, and you I always said what I had to say, but I said, sir, and I saluted. That's good. <laughs> You had a college degree before you ever joined the Army. Yes, I did. But you didn't come in as an officer. No, they selected, you know, the first class had 440 officers, 444 candidates. Mm -hmm. 44 of them were black. I was not one of that group. I don't think I applied. I probably didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. And then they brought in the second group, I believe. But I think I was the first enlisted class, 173 of us. The first enlisted class of basic trainees. Yes. That were... City had first, you had two, two classes for officers mm -hmm. who were supposed to be trained in order to train us. That's correct. And then they brought in the enlisted people who were to be trained by those who had been trained. <laughs> when did you decide and, and make application for uh, officer candidate school? I don't know. One morning I woke up and the headlines in the newspaper was that they needed women to help win the war by playing in the band. 
but I've never seen a parade, so what did I know? <laughs> but since I had played in the band in high school, I played a cornet and a French horn, and I learned a little saxophone, I thought it would be a good time to improve and be a good musician, and that's why I joined. And you joined the Army and then didn't get to be a band member, no. but you did get to be a mail clerk, and then you went on, and then you applied for officer candidate school. I don't know what I applied or how I got there. I remember taking the test. I remember being selected. Mm -hmm. But also, I know that uh, when I was moved up to the regimental command, I became battalion commander of the black troops to 1800. Uh -huh. And of course, one of my jobs was to go back and kind of supervise the band. The band that you couldn't play in. That is right. <laughs> but they did have a black band well, they at had that an time. They had an excellent one. They organized a black because we used to have these meetings, and we sure we had a spy in the meeting who went back and told the commandant what we planned. And I remember him calling us in one morning and said, you know, I've just decided to have a black band. So we know somebody told him, but we didn't care. We took the band. Good. It was an excellent band. After you became an officer, what field did you go into? They kept me at Fort Des Moines for 40 long months. You didn't join the Army to see the world, did you? No. <laughs> I stayed there like, when we, uh, out of our charcoal burning thing, when we had, uh, they decided to uh, create a black regiment at Fort Des Moines. And all of the basic people, including the blacks, lived off the base below the grass. I forgot what we call it, mud tile or something. The officers lived in the officers' quarters where they had grass. They moved all of the whites from mud town up on in the officers' quarters section with the grass and left us there. Because we were going to become the black regiment. So we planned our strategy. We met, and we were supposed to meet at 8 o'clock Saturday morning with the colonel and all of his entourage. So we appointed Martha Suttle, who did not have a PhD. And she was, when the colonel got through talking, she was supposed to get up and say, sir, it's just cut and dry. And that's exactly what she did. When we met at 8 o'clock, all these people were there. He got up and said all the things they were going to do and who's going to get promoted and how this is going to be an outstanding black outfit. And when he finished, Settle got up and said, sir, it's just cut and dry. He says, yes, lieutenant. Then we had an officer by the name of W. Round Tree Johnson, who was in that first class. She took off her cap bars, she put them on the table, she came to attention, and she told the colonel he had sent us back a hundred years. And she talked, and she talked, and she talked, and every one of the white officers finally left. But Monday morning, they moved all of the white troops back with us <laughs> in one town and, and, and th broke up the regiment. And this was back in 1940, 42, 43, I guess it was. 43. So. It, it's amazing. You went on, I, I'm kind of hurrying you along in your military career because you've had such a marvelously distinguished career after you retired from the military, but you kind of left the WAC, didn't you? When when you went out further, you became a WAF. Didn't have an alternative. The regulations at that time was that women would be assigned to the various branches. They didn't promise you would stay there and become a part of that branch. Uh -huh. I was getting ready to go overseas, mm -hmm. but they decided, you know, when they first sent women overseas, they didn't send the blacks. This glory, you only know, when the flag fell down. That's right. <laughs> I, I know that. So, we did, so I was out on parade drive, so they had a parade drive, and I got orders to come back to the regiment. They told me I was going to take it off, and I was going to Nebraska to take over that command because the lady who was running it had been shipped out. And what was happening there was that they said all the women were homosexual. And when I got in, the colonel told me what went on and he wanted me to stop it. Find out what it was to stop it. <laughs> well, I was just a second lieutenant, I think. First lieutenant, something like that. So when I talked to the women, the thing I found out was that, you know, when we first went in, if you go back and look at the newspapers, they said we went in as prostitutes to take the place of the women who hung around the gates at the old Army. But uh, when I talked to the women, what made them furious is when they got off the train in Nebraska, Lincoln, Nebraska, 
all of the black soldiers were standing there and they would pick out their woman. <laughs> And this Susie was theirs, and this was theirs, and they did the same thing when they went to Port Rochuga. They worked a lot of arms and legs when they had a dance with the women. The women resented. The women that I had in Nebraska had an IQ of 130, every single woman. And they weren't going to put up no, with that, were they? They didn't like that. And so who did they go with? They went with the pilots. We had a, we had a commander by the name of Hollywood Herbert. <laughs> And Hollywood Herbert called me and he said he didn't give a damn who they were going with. <laughs> you know, he didn't blame them, they didn't want to put up that treatment. And he said, who do you want to go with? We don't have any black officers here. He said, now you got a list of man, that's fine. If you like one of us, that's fine. He said, well, we don't expect you all to practice celibacy and be isolated just because of this nonsense. Which I thanked him, but I was sorry for the simple reason when I was in Des Moines, Iowa. I could never join an officer's club. Never set foot in it. No black officer. When I went to Lincoln, you joined because you was an officer. And I couldn't afford that $7, so I always wish I was still colored. <laughs> what you're telling me is that at Fort Des Moines, because it didn't make any difference what your rank was. Your color dictated whatever you did. Yeah, that's correct. It's my understanding that they only had 10 women who belonged to that club because the young women who ran around with us refused to go. When you say young women that ran around with you, you're talking about the young white officers yes. because it didn't are, mean anything to them. No, they all came from college in New York and around. You know, this was nonsense to them. Every Friday we had to go out on the parade ground to practice calisthenics. And the carrot was that once you finished, you went to the officers club for free beer sandwiches. Everybody with us. The blacks were not allowed to go. No, we got a camp at the town. So so did the whites. <laughs> Good for them. You know, I'm glad to know that they did. Oh, they did. But you would, now, we didn't end segrega segregation in the Army until 1949. So you underwent a number of years. One of the things I recall was when it was to make women a part of the regular Army, I was selected to go to Kentucky to take the test. So I drove from Ohio to Kentucky. And when I got there, the white officers who were there and had been assigned to sleep in Fortis and Officers Club. They didn't have any place for me to sleep. They were down on them, they had a black officer. So I had to physically sleep in the bed with the black woman who ran the recreation center. Oh. She was fierce and so was I. I would think so. But you know, we were civilized. We made it through the night. <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't ask you anything further than that. The word got to the, the command national, they sent an official policy. They were embarrassed. So. But by the time I went to the take my test, which was oral, I was so furious. I guess that's why I flunked. I didn't pass. I had never flunked anything before. So I thought I had really let my race down for three years. I was sad as could be. But I found that every bit of discrimination that happened to me turned out to be the best. Okay. Tell well, us. because when the women went in and who got selected to the regular. You know, they found out you had this bill called the White Charger. At age 50, you had to be a permanent lieutenant colonel. Uh, yeah, permanent lieutenant colonel. Well, those billets were open from the men came under that. So that was very competitive. So a lot of our fine women who came into the service, when they hit the age of 50, and they didn't get lieutenant colonel permanent, they were put out for 10 years soon. Just left. Just I could have been on those. But segregation kept me from being that, <laughs> so I didn't have to worry. <laughs> well, I, I, how, how wonderful that you can look at this as, as a positive in, well, instead of a fault. negative. It wasn't that fault. It was That's just true. the Army. Same thing happened when I went to Austin County School. There were three of us in the class, three blacks. We weren't allowed to sleep in the barracks with those women. You know, we had double bunks, so big deal. So we don't care about not sleeping in the bunks. <laughs> they gave us a private room. You were better than the, cat, the white candidates. And so they, they do that. They were real mad one real white. I said, you know, because we're color. So we decided to test the mother. And we asked the commander if she objected if we went and took our baths before they did. She thought that was sexual. So she was from the South. She was pleased. So everybody would get up and take our bath. We had the whole bathroom by ourselves. And the, and the hottest water. <laughs> we had probably. everything. Then we came back and closed our doors when the whistle went off. The 297. Who down to the bathroom and found that way when we got a chance, we were all finished and dressed. And we were glad again we were colored. It worked out just fine. You know, it seems to me that your attitude 
you never really looked at it as segregation, but as an opportunity to, to further yourself and, and your cause of women. Well, I, did, I, just, I knew that those women there were not, they didn't create those laws. We wanted the laws of the army. And that's where it had always been. They had not seen fit to change. They didn't care whether they succeeded. They were going to succeed despite it. But, you know, they just call it wills now. When you were giving a speech at the WAC Veterans Association, you made the comment about, I would rather change my mind and succeed than not change my mind and fail. And that's what you're saying about the Army. Absolutely. They failed for a long, long time because they refused to change their mind. That's right. But you women forced those changes and then succeeded. And then I think the Chinese had a lot to do with the persons. Like yes, those. tell that story, would you please? Well, it's always been my understanding that when they took prisoners of the war, the ranking officer was always put in charge. When they took the prisoners in China, that's during that uh, Yellow River thing, yes. the Chinese brought them all together and segregated them by race and said, I want you to feel right at home. Well, that really shook up a bit. Because some of our young men went to China and they said they were bringing bring the lots for communism. We couldn't afford that. And that's when Harry Truman? That's what they told us in a secret meeting. I've never heard it since. Well, it makes sense. Sure it makes sense. It makes sense. And then that's when the 24th, 25th entry, I believe it was, had been wiped out. They didn't have any replacement there. We had the 24th entry, which were all black. Yes. Too much remember the black men trained with broomsticks and not guns. Yes. They weren't trained that well. But, but they stood up and they But they did it. very well of when course. they went over. They did very We've well. We've always done well and whatever. Everybody does well when you give them a chance. And they That's have to correct. Do it. You know, just play them simple. All right, let's 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 move ahead a little bit. You, 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 when they made the United States Air Force, and you were in the Army Air Corps, yes. you became a member of the United States Air Force and served the rest of your service in the Air Force. Yes, well, you know, when they separated the Army from the Air Force, I think that was, what, 1948? 1948, 49, in that area. Well, wherever you were, that's where you stayed. Yes. So I had no, nothing to do with it. And you went on and you completed your service, and because this is a whack film, I'm going to say, and you completed very honorable service in 1963 and retired from the military. 20 years, six months and 17 days. But then you went on, and I'd like you to tell us, because you've had a very distinguished career. I, you have a, you have two bachelor's dis degrees, you have a master's degree, you have attended all kinds of different schooling, but I'd like you to tell us about your life. You had a career, you could have gone home, enjoyed yourself the rest of your life, but you didn't. You went on and did some wonderful things, and would you please tell us about it? Well, you know, because I think about my career, I don't know if mine was any different unless there were some of my sisters who married more housewives. Well, they're and both I important. Had, I thought they were. <laughs> and, uh, but I guess I took after my mother. I, I always had a sense of wanting to know. And that has always moved me to read the best books or try to meet the best people. Uh, walk across the best colleges and say, I have been. <laughs> I like that. And I did go to Cambridge just for a short course. I took a chance and applied. I've always just taken a chance to keep people honest. That's the way you keep honest. It's asked to do something. And just take a chance. Okay, so you went. But when did you go with the Department of Labor? After I retired, and I retired in May of I guess the first of June of 63. But I was had gone to some graduate school. And we, were, we got our degree on May the 31st of 63. And it took us to Heidelberg. And, and the commencement speech was given in French. The substrate was just quite a it's quite a setting. Down there we had beer, but a stupid French had. <laughs> so it was, it was all very good. But in order to get back into civilian life, I thought that perhaps I should go to school. So I applied to go to the School of International Relations at the University of Vienna, the summer school in St. Wolfgang, Austria, mm -hmm. and I was accepted. And so I went there, and I failed one of the courses because, you know, they never let us talk about communism in the military. And I remember I had an oral test. They wanted to know who was the president of Russia, and of course I didn't know. <laughs> you know, I wasn't there to know. <laughs> I was supposed to know. 
And I didn't know who he was. The man couldn't believe it. They gave me a seat. Broke my heart. <laughs> but it was an interesting bit of thing. And I remember that I had heard in America that about Chumba Checkers, who let everybody know that they could dance. Okay. At that time, only people that could dance were blacks. Oh, oh, yes. When Chumba Checkers came on the scene, everybody could dance. And do the twist. Do the twist. And that was exciting. And then there was somebody who wrote a song while I had my thrill on Mulberry Hill. I forgot who he was. I heard about the student senate, but I had never heard of Martin Luther King. Mm -hmm. Just had not. A young lady from Memphis, Tennessee came over, and she had been one of the students of it. Time to going to work for the government in the Department of Labor. What was your first job? First job I got when with the Department of Labor was uh, a contract expert. Contract? Expert. But now I remember you're telling me that they didn't let women in to procurement. I tell you, there were two women that got in in procurement and manpower management. I was the second. I can't remember who the first lady was who was in okay. and, and she was in procurement. They announced in the, when I was in Europe that anyone who worked in manpower certainly ought to know something about contracts and that they had to go to contract school. The men didn't want to hear it. And I was selected to go to the Army contract school, the hardest class I've ever attended in my life. Really? But I remember the terms. You know, the procurement was just, it was just, really. And I've forgotten how many we, I did graduate the, the, the 10th, the highest of the class. Mm -hmm. But a whole lot of them flunked that. We came all over in Europe to this class. And I took, took the course and I finished. You know, I was a formal contracting officer. So I represented the, the general on all the manpower teams when we went out. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, came up with the manpower that they needed. If they're starting a new base, the team would go out and we'd try to decide how many manpower people we need to do this particular job. And some of it we might contract out and some of it we assign military people to. But that's how I got my training, by going to the school, in, I forgot, somewhere in Germany. Okay. So yeah. then when you retired, did you immediately go to work for the government? No, I hadn't thought what I was going to do. I was trying to decide whether to go to law school or what. When I came back to America, I enrolled in, uh, I went to the School of International Relations at American University, because mm -hmm. that kind of intrigued me. And while I was there, they started the poverty program under, under Lyndon Johnson. And they didn't have any contract people at all. They all came out of the military. See, the Department of Labor, they didn't have a contract except buying supplies and soaps and that sort of thing. So this new engineering thing of these social programs meant that they didn't have contract people. And I remember sitting talking to a young man, a white guy, I told him I would join the Department of Labor they were saying they needed a contract. He said, well, don't you do that. This is going to be an all segregated outfit, I'll bet you. And I said, well, maybe so, maybe not. But anyway, I went to a dance one night and ran into some recruiters. And they asked me what I was doing. They knew I'd just come out. And I told him I hadn't decided. I was going back to Germany to wash my feet in the Rhine for the last time. And they escaped, turned my name in, so I got a letter asking if I'd come in for an interview. And I went in. They wanted to hire me that day for fifty dollars a day. That was a lot of money. But I told them I'd still go back to Germany. And I did go back. But I came back. And they hired me, brought me on the job as an expert. And I think they had about two contracting officers who covered the whole United States for the quality program. So they'd call me at midnight to be ready to catch the eight o'clock flight out. You know, just like you picked up your razor and you shave it kit the way you went. But I did that for four months. Then they decided I should be a civil servant, which I didn't know anything about. Somebody went down, they rated me as a GS-13, and that's how I came into the government. I still don't know how, but I became a civil servant because somebody said I should be. Again, and, making what could have been an adversarial position of one of, of success. That's what it was. And then at that time, uh, I became chief of a policy, some kind of policy division as well as we did a lot of contracting. Mm -hmm. And it was very fascinating to find out uh, if we did the poverty programs, one of the things that I find interesting is down south and also in Massachusetts, women who worked in the hospital as supervisors got about a dollar for five cents an hour. Our law said that we could not employ any of the people that we were trying to upgrade for less than a dollar for five cents an hour. 
So it meant that these, some of these women were making 80 cents an hour, training some of these school kids a dollar 25 cents an hour. But as a result of that, they had to upgrade the amount of money they paid them an hour. And to bring their salaries higher than the people. Mm -hmm. We never got a contract in Springfield, Massachusetts. They refused. Just no, I'd never get a contract in Springfield. Isn't that interesting? So that had a big impact on raising the salaries of women again, mm -hmm. which I thought was good. Oh, yes. Now you went on in the Department of Labor. I've got this here. And you went on, and now you are in a regional director. I'm a regional administrator. A regional administrator. We have 10 regional administrators throughout the United States, and we report directly to Washington. And tell me director. just a little bit what you do. Well, why is this kept? The Women's Bureau was created June the 5th, 1920, and signed into law by Woodrow Wilson. Our mission was to improve the working conditions of women. It's a very vague thing, but that's what we do. We go out and we make speeches and we try to figure out right now one of the initiatives we've been working on is trying to get women in non-traditional careers. We have a fact sheet out that discusses, give them the skills that'll pay the bills. Because you pay the same thing for bread that anybody else pays who makes $50 an hour. That's correct. So we're trying to get women out of getting non-traditional careers. What we mean by non-traditional careers is where you have 80% of the same gender working on a job, and then you get in, you can assume that that's a non-traditional career. So we were trying to get them into construction on highways, tiling, being president of the United States, which is said to be a non-traditional career for a woman. That's right. That's the type of thing. That's the conference I'm having next month for women in non-traditional careers, trying to encourage them. They try to get women off welfare. The women come off of welfare to get a job, a Micmac job as we call it, with big dolls, making three thirty an hour does not pay her to get off welfare. No, she can she can do more on welfare and be with her children. Absolutely. So what they're trying to do now is to get them into jobs that really pay the bills. And where they can hold their head up with pride. We got women work out there in the air force airport, the new international airport. So I've talked to them. And while they're not interested in making that a career, they're real pleased to be making 10 and 12 dollars an hour. And they can do that until they find something that will pay them the same salaries with them doing a different job. And by doing this, you're creating jobs out there. We're taking people off welfare. We're giving them back their pride. I just met with the warden of Canyon City for where the women's penitentiary is. Mm -hmm. See what he's doing for the women. I said, we try to get women off of welfare here, and you send them back on the streets to have to go back on welfare. Yes. So we've been working with him to try to get him to set up tasks in the jobs where they work, like food helpers. I was talking about the day that we pour in con uh, concrete. And so we said, these could be jobs on the job training. Give them so many hours. Absolutely. Give them a certificate so they can come out. So that's what we're working with. Christmas there, those women. Sounds wonderful. Let, let's kind of bring this around, if we may, full cycle. You've had a wonderfully distinguished career in the Department of Labor, You and, and I know you've done some wonderful things. But let's get it back to the military for a minute. Do, what do you think were the, the most important things you learned in the military, or maybe didn't learn, knew already, but were reinforced in the military, that helped you do the work you're doing now? Or was there? I guess it was college loyalty and 